Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces. And for those that do not know me, my name is George Varga. I am Hungarian by birth and American by choice. And I am an immigrant. Where does one begin a story that's 75 years old? You begin 75 years ago. The year is 1944, and America and the Allies just invaded Europe, and uh, the battle to liberate uh, the European countries has begun. It is D-Day. And the invasion's underway. But even as uh, the battles are being fought and blood is shed by both sides, uh, the world powers have already begun to posture and to position themselves and negotiate um, for a post-war Europe. In October of 1944, at the Moscow Convention, Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin get together and basically, not to trivialize it, but something like businessmen might work out over a glass of wine and cigars, they negotiated the future of uh, European countries. <clears throat> They would even cynically refer to it as the naughty doc doctrine document uh, when they worked out the percentages and wrote, wrote down how each country would be uh, divided by influence under the Western and how much of it would be under uh, Stalin's jurisdiction. Churchill's primary goal was, of course, to retain as much of the Western influence as he could, where Stalin was more interested in creating a buffer zone between him and the West. And this buffer zone is what would later become known as the Iron Curtain. In February of 1945, the war still underway, we had the Yalta Convention, this time once again with Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and FDR attending. Um, once again, Joseph Stalin made all the arrangements, micromanaged the event, um, even to the point of providing uh, housing for each of the principles and attendance. These principles were also bugged. It's an established fact. And he even manipulated uh, the time of the meetings in the day, late in the evening, to his advantage. A week and an ailing FDR was in attendance. This is February. And by April, FDR was dead. Stalin, of course, never really intended to abide by these agreements. Uh, his philosophy was possession is occupation, and he would uh, simply retain these, uh, these jurisdictions after the war. By March of 1953, Joseph Stalin was dead. Hungary, of course, was part of this Iron Curtain. Uh, once part of the uh, huge Austro-Hungarian uh, empire, by the 1980 Treaty of Trianon, Hungary had lost two-thirds of its land mass and half of its population. With a population of approximately 10 million people, Hungary, uh, about a quarter of them reside in Budapest and its surroundings. Um, in physical area, it's probably about the size of Indiana. And for those that uh, don't remember their geography, we have, to its north, we have Slovakia. 
to the Northeast, uh, at the time Soviet Union, now Ukraine, to the Southeast, uh, Romania, to the South, what was then Yugoslavia, now it's Croatia, etc. Um, again, going around Slovenia, and finally the most important, Austria, to the Northwest. There's about 175 miles of Austrian border, and this becomes of crucial importance uh, later in the years. As the war was being fought, the Russian army was marching through Hungary from east to the west. They arrived in Budapest on Christmas Eve 1944, and they would occupy for the next 45 years with the last Russians leaving in 1989. I included this slide for a number of reasons. Um, this is 1953, partly to illustrate the grim working conditions. Um, might have been interpreted, take your kid to work day. <laughs> or I was interning at my father's workplace, I'm not sure. Um, even among these, during these uh, difficult, grueling times, they found some, some pleasure. The date of this is uh, significant. To Europeans, uh, soccer is a religion. And on November 25th, Hungary was playing England in a match of the century, and Hungary won. <laughs> so all the dads took their kids to uh, work, and listen, we listened to the football game on, on uh, soccer game, excuse me, on the radio. The country during these interim years had really suffered deeply. It was uh, difficult times. It was badly, badly neglected. Um, as you can see, buildings. And keep in mind, some of these pictures were taken in the early 2000s. And some of this still shows the uh, neglect of city structures. Some of these are residences that I lived in. The summer of 1956 it was an unusual summer. Um, somehow my father had arranged for my older sister and I to travel to Slovakia to meet his mother and my aunt and uncle. Um, <coughs> travel in Hungary was very difficult in those days and travel outside, even to another communist country, was very difficult. So how he achieved it, I'm not sure. But in any case, we traveled from Budapest by train. As you navigate up along the Danube, where the Danube turns west to go toward Vienna, uh, is the city of Estergom. Um, at this point, we cross the bridge. This is the Danube. And on the far side is Slovakia at the time Czechoslovakia. This is the Hungarian half of the bridge. I think you can see the flag in mid-bridge. And on the way back is the Slovak half of it. And our goal was to go to a small town uh, in Slovakia called Mostenica. Um, the actual transfer of us took place in, in the middle of the bridge. Some like something out of, out of the uh, Cold War in East Berlin, uh, Checkpoint Charlie. My father took us to the middle of the bridge. His brother met us mid, midway, and uh, having, after not having seen each other for t over, over 10 years, uh, they had a brief visit and he handed us over, and we would continue the rest of our journey with him on our way to Mostenica. Um, the nearest significant town is a place called Banska Bistrica, and Mostenica is a small village about, about 15 kilometers from there. 
So we ended up there, of course. Uh, unique customs of local customs of greeting uh, new guests with salt and bread and water. Um, it was a fun two weeks. We got to know one another, um, a small village, everybody knows your business. <laughs> Every, we were somewhat of a novelty as, uh, and the grandmother was a deeply, deeply religious Catholic woman. And she was just uh, odd struck that at our age, we had not been confirmed in the Catholic Church. And it was her goal to correct this. So she set about uh, arranging her plans uh, at the church up on the hill. I think you can actually, uh, you can actually see the church. Uh, yeah, right there. Sits up on a hill overlooking this little quaint little village that uh, has one road in, one road out. Um, so grandmother, uh, my sister, Val, Valerie, got a new dress. I got a new suit for our confirmation at the local church. So, there is the summer of 1956. Apparently I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet. <laughs> but there we are at the top of the hill. And a, a few years later, I found that same tree at the top of the hill. The uh, interesting visit in there was, as I was just scavenging around trying to see anything familiar, the church lady had stumbled into me and uh, we introduced ourselves as best as we could. Uh, I spoke no Slovakian, she spoke no English or, or no Hungarian, so we had a little bit of, bit of a communications gap, but she was very gracious and allowed me to go inside, take some pictures of the church inside. And uh, at one point she took me by the hand inside and she led me to this one specific pew and somehow conveyed to me that this were my grandmother and my aunt and uncle where they would sit and pray. Uh, kind of a touching moment. Um, and then my interest was also in trying to find a little bit of the family history and so I was trying to get across to her, where's the cemetery? Naturally, you might assume that it would be next to the church. And uh, we just could not seem to communicate. And I'm drawing on a yellow legal tablet. I'm drawing tombstones with little crosses on them. She thought I was trying to find a hotel or something. <laughs> this is a town or village, even today, about 200 residents. Hotels are not big there. In any case, we did communicate, and it was, it was just a wonderful visit. This is the spring of that year before, before uh, the visit. I'm the uh, kid on the front row, second one from the end, the blonde hair. And uh, what, you, what the black and white picture does not convey this is communist Hungary, and we're sitting there all in our little pioneer uniforms with our white shirts and our red neckerchiefs. This is a culture that was already being taught and, and ingrained even in the young people. Um, So we enjoyed our time uh, in Mostenica, and interestingly enough, halfway through our visit, Dad was able to come and join us. Um, a little story about how determined this man is. Um, while we were just enjoying our visit, uh, uh, let me back up a second. While we're visiting there, uh, one day, our uncle takes us out uh, to let their goat graze. We are two city kids here. 
we go up the side of the hill and he just tethers out the goat in the middle of this little field and he said, you kids just lay back, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the day. Whenever you get tired, bring the goat back down. The goat didn't want to come back down. <laughs> so we're playing this tease game of one of us trying to distract the goat while the other one's trying to untie. And somehow we finally made it back. But uh, city kids are not, uh, not necessarily goat, goat herders. <laughs> As I was saying, my father came to join us. Um, so he comes by train again to Banska Bystrica. He gets there in the dead of night and realizes that there's no other community or no other transportation until the following morning, the village being 15 kilometers away. This didn't deter him. He grabs his bags in total darkness in a foreign country and he walked and he joined us. Uh, he never, never saw this as an obstacle. I think his philosophy was that if his road came up to a mountain, he didn't see it as an obstacle. He simply saw it as a, as a rise in the road. And that, that was his, his uh, uh, approach to problem solving. We enjoyed this vacation, but our world was about to change dramatically. So as school begins, uh, I start my fifth grade in school. And as I said, everything was communist programmed. Um, foreign language being, was being taught in the fifth grade. And, uh, and of course, it was Russian language. I learned a few things like counting to 10 few other Russian words, and then a few other Russian words that I found and learned outside the classroom. <laughs> those were not taught in the classroom. And those were saved for uh, some of our comments against the Russian occupiers. Let me back up just a second. The uh, Again, this is October 23rd now, and there's a great deal of unrest and dissatisfaction, just an oppressive, oppressive life, constant food shortages, natural resources all being sent back to Russia, um, food shortages. It, it was just a difficult. One of the things that uh, was near to our residence was the city park and this huge parade ground and on this parade ground is this podium um, this is where they had the what seemed like a, a never-ending parade of, of par parades military parades whatever the excuse was May Day or any one of a half a dozen others this is where the VIPs would stand, and uh, this is where dictators and would-be dictators who lo seem to love military parades because they see them as a tribute to their own grandiosity. It's a massive podium made of pink marble. Uh, but really its primary function was just that, the 50, 60 foot Stalin statue. With the October 23rd, as things began to boil over, before the evening was over, part of statue was gone and about a six foot set of boots was the only remaining Something like uh, what we might have seen in more recent years during the Iraq invasion as uh, Americans were trying to pull down the statue of Saddam. <coughs> kind of kind of a, a deja vu feeling. But that evening, um, 
my father took us out to that as uh, during the daytime a number of students and other academics had begun to uh, to demand some changes. They wrote up uh, a number of items that they wished to be able to read at the radio station. Um, renouncing the Soviet occupation, demanding free democratic elections, and instituting economic reforms. So by the end of the day, as workers got off, the factory workers, they joined these groups. And as I said, they marched on the radio station Depending on what reports you read, perhaps as many as 100,000 people. As they stood in protest outside this radio station demanding to be heard and air their demands, they were fired upon. The much despised security army, security force, uh, referred to as the AVO, A-V-O. They were notoriously uh, cruel, and they fired into the crowd. There were several deaths and many injuries. And as word spread of what is happening, more and more people joined in. And pretty soon, uh, this really gained momentum, and people were realizing that something was truly under underway. Uh, the communist government began to panic and realizing what they might already have on their hands, they called out for the Hungarian army to come out and quell this. And that was a mistake. The Hungarian army showed up and they refused to fire on their own people. This is as some of the protest was growing, getting underway being fired upon. The commander in charge was Colonel P Paul Maleter. And he, as I said, refused to fire on his people. And instead they gave weapons and sided with the, with the revolutionaries. As the revolt ultimately failed, he would later be tried, convicted, and executed for his crime of treason. <clears throat> During the next few days, uh, shooting, violence, as the revolution was still being fought, and it's interesting to note that from all walks of life, Kids with guns took part in this. <coughs> Young girls, old men. There's a picture of a guy with a, with a wooden, a peg leg, if you will, and he's carrying a weapon. It, it crossed all walks of life. Everybody, everybody was involved in this fight for their freedom. The government, for a while, tried sort of a game of musical chairs as they attempted to position different people, different names into uh, leadership, thinking that one might satisfy the populace. Uh, this didn't really work. But for some few days, it just seemed like the revolution just might, just might succeed, that it just might be pulled off. During this time, um, it was difficult. People literally were having to scramble for something to eat uh, while there were still bodies laying in the streets. Uh, it was chaos, it was war. Some buildings were just really devastated. So even while people were thinking that this just might have a chance to succeed, uh, of course, it was not meant to be. Uh, Hungarians had started a battle that they couldn't win and one that the Soviet Union could not afford to lose. 
So on November the 4th, we woke up on a Sunday. And the city was being shelled. Um, the attack was not only meant to quell the riots, but it was such magnitude and such brutality as to send the message to not only this country, but any other, to ensure that no one would ever attempt uh, a revolt against. At this point, we were no longer comfortable for our physical safety and moved to our cellar. Now these Hungarian European apartments had these below the street level cellars and this is where uh, people kept their piles of coal for heating. And it was our, uh, usually the oldest children's, part of their chores was to go down with a bucket and bring up the coal for heating and, and cooking and such. And it was a dark and cold and uninviting place, but certainly not designed for any occupation. But we improvised and we created whatever bedding you could make down there. And we spent the next two weeks trying to wait out the violence. When the active shooting sort of died down, my father took Valerie and I out to see some of the devastation. And one of the memories that I still carry with me was seeing the charred remaining arm hanging off a steering wheel in one of the burned out uh, armored cars. Factories were still idle. Schools were still empty of children. Um, government functions were still in limbo. When we came up, this is our apartment with the second story This is our window, and if you'll note the flag holder, I'll refer to that a little later. Um, we came up and wondered how to resume the rest of our lives and what will the future hold. So, we are in mid-November, and as I said, um, people are starting to figure out, okay, the revolution failed, and now, what's going to happen? Will things get any better? Will it get worse? Simply the unknown. As eventually, people started going back to school, people started going back to work, mostly, just because you had to, to provide food, something, for your families. Um, eventually, my father did go back to work. Uh, but here I'll switch back a little bit, back to World War II. As the war was winding down, uh, my father was in the Hungarian army, and they were unwillingly allied with the, uh, with the Germany. So as the war is winding down, he finds himself in Austria, and as the German army is retreating, he finds himself more or less abandoned near a place called uh, Mickeldorf, Austria, and uh, kind of a fend for yourself. You're on your own, find your way home best as you can. Dad being the resourceful guy, he's seen to have found a, uh, an American group of GIs in Mostenitz, uh, uh, in Mickeldorf. And this is the part of the story where I would give a million dollars to have him and his American friend back to pick their brains a little. But he befriended this American GI by the name of Charles Bramer. Charlie was with the 11th Armored Division and both these, both these young soldiers are in their, in their 20s. 
and somehow they formed a, a, a friendship, a bond, in that brief period of time. As the war was ending, uh, they had both sur survived and, and faced difficult times behind them, but both were anxious to return to their, to their normal lives and their families. And before they parted, parted company to go back to their respective lives, they exchanged contact information. Again, this is somewhere mid-1945. Mid and before they parted, his friend Charlie strongly suggested to my dad, go home, round up your family, and take them to America. Dad came home and he presented this idea to mom. Mom's in her early 20s. She has a three-year-old daughter and is pregnant with me. I can only picture my mom saying, are you out of your mind? <laughs> she was tickled to have her husband back from the war, but the thought of going to a foreign place with one young child and another on the way, uh, leaving her parents behind, perhaps never to see them again. Um, Dad just couldn't sell it. And it was just not meant to be. Reluctantly, he put his dreams on hold and tried to resume his life. And he mustered out of the army somewhere around 1953 and returned to civilian life. If you'll remember the welding picture, he went to work on the uh, Hungarian metro. Anyone that's been to Budapest, there are four metro lines. The red line crosses under the Danube between Buda and Pest. And at that time, he worked. Um, as under water, these were construction done under pressure. And they would have to compress going in, decompress coming out. And a number of times I remember him having to get up in the middle of the night and go back for further decompression because pain, painful, the bends, much like divers. And this was a project that would kind of stop and go depending on political interruptions, financial interruptions, but nevertheless, he worked there. And later, uh, went to work for a place called the Gans, G-A-N-Z. It's a huge military, uh, uh, I mean, industrial uh, factory. And he worked there right up to the day we left. That would be his last job in Hungary. As he goes back to work, um, trying to resume some normal life. By the way, Dad owned a shortwave radio. And by mid-November, we were starting to hear transmissions from Austria of people who had crossed over into Austria, escaped. And they would send back notices to their remaining family members back, back home. Yes, we made it. We're in good shape, we're healthy. And of course, this kind of reawakened his dream. I'm sure at some point he revisited the topic with mom. And I think at some point, uh, maybe he <coughs> convinced her that as living conditions had not improved, if anything would continue to deteriorate, I think maybe she found it more, a little more palatable to sell. So, as I said, with Dad having gone back to work, I think very, very few friends that he could confide with, but uh, I think several of his close co-workers, they had begun exploring the idea of possibly leaving the country. And I think he found some others who also entertained the same idea. And a plan was devised for maybe four or five families to get together at a prearranged time. And on the morning of November 29th, we woke up 
dressed for winter. We walked out of our apartment, leaving the beds unmade, carrying only hand, hand baggage. We walked out and went to the Eastern, the Kelly Railroad Station. It's merely eight or nine city blocks from where we lived. And when we got there to meet with his friends, um, one person showed up. And it seemed that their fear or discomfort overcame their hopes, and everybody changed their mind, leaving, leaving our family as nothing was going to change Dad's minds. He was determined. He was going to go west. So we get on the train, and it was like a zoo. It was like you would have thought it was vacation season and everybody wanted to take their vacation all at the same time. On the train, everybody seemed to be quiet, deep in thought. Maybe they're wrestling with their own decisions about the future. Conversations were scarce. Maybe the chatter of young children. At one point, my younger sister had shared with no, no one in particular that we were going to see Kashvahir Bar to visit our grandmother. Well, everybody kind of smiled quietly because we'd already passed that hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody understood that we were more or less all on the same trip, leaving one life behind in search of something better. The train was headed to Hungary names, cities and towns have these names this long. Mosho Magyarovar is a city near the Austrian border, and that's where the train was headed. That was our intent, to get off there. And on the train, the word came that they were checking travel papers at the station. And if you, ha you didn't have a, a good, legitimate reason to be there, there would be questions asked and issues raised. And so probably still 30, 40 kilometers from the city, the train pulls up in the middle of the field. And that's another vision that I will remember forever. Kind of late in the day, just the sun is setting, and people are just getting off both sides of the train, just like fleeing. <sighs> Not sure. But people are just pouring out of that train and just uh, taking off on foot. And soon the train began once again with a lighter load and disappeared down the, down the track. My father had grown up in Moshon Majarovar because his father was a gendarme and a border patrol, uh, and that was his, his territory. He was familiar with the, the neighborhood, the neighboring towns. So as our, our family of, of six, mom and dad, Val, myself, and two younger sisters, six of us by now, we uh, took off on foot, heading for this small village, Uyronafu, just another Hungarian small village, insignificant, but for us it was a life-saving uh, way station. Once again, I would give anything to know whether these were people that he knew or whether they were just gracious fellow Hungarians but we ended up at, at a home. They took us in. By this time, of course, it's dark. They took us in, fed us, bedded us down for the night. This is November 29. The next day we got up and we took off again on foot. This time we were able to travel on paved road uh, to the next village. Moshon Sent Janos, another mouthful. This is about another 10 kilometers closer. 
And once again, same experience. Another family took us in, fed us, let us sleep. Whether these people are someone that my father knew, or once again, if they were just generous uh, people who saw a family in need, uh, never know, but forever grateful to them. They shared their food, their home, and we were grateful. So from that home, the last day of November, 1956, this would be our last day in Hungary, and we pre prepared for the last leg of our journey. Somewhere my father had gotten a hold of a map. If you all remember the old high school type oil cloth back maps that we used to pull down, where he got it, I don't know, but he had this snippet of a map, and he had drawn out his path of escape. My mom still has this to this day. Before we left our last host family, I think Dad gave them whatever little money we had, knowing that we wouldn't have any use for it if all went well. We bundled up. My younger sister was two years old, obviously too young to walk, and my father took his, his belt, looped it around his neck, and she sat in that belt facing him. Once we got a couple of days down the road, Dad could barely raise his arm for a couple of days. <laughs> we didn't really know any fear. We were kids. We knew that our parents would never let harm come to us. We took off again on foot on country road looking for any signs of patrols. And here time references, hour of the day, you kind of lose track. And this was a few years ago. But we'd heard considerable, we traveled considerable distance, but we had uh, heard some sounds traveling in our direction. So we scrambled, hid in a ditch until it became apparent that it was a, another local farmer with a hay cart, if you will, bringing more, uh, more escapees. So as we, uh, my father, cautiously approached the group, and after a brief conversation, some of us were allowed to get on, on the uh, ride and uh, Kind of, a, kind of a belated hay rack ride uh, in the late winter. Once again, he took us as far as he felt comfortable. And before we parted, uh, I think the, the local farmer explained to, uh, after having conversation with my dad, he explained to the, to the group that my father had some familiarity and that they might, uh, they might do well to stick with us rather than venture off on their own. And this was a small group, again, couples. There were young men in their teens who were really not even dressed for winter, much less uh, for November. Um, and again, we traveled more cross country across plowed fields. I had failed to mention back in, back in Slovakia before we left our grandparents, my grandmother gave me a, a pair of new boots, kind of chukka boots with these heavy lug soles. Well, these were my prized possessions, of course, except when we're walking across plowed fields, these boots just clung <laughs> like pounds and pounds of mud and just became, became a chore, just try to suck the shoes off your feet. Um, finally, late, late at night, everybody was tired, exhausted, and the decision was made to stop. 
and we found these huge haystacks and we dug out the bottoms of them, packed the women and children, myself included, and of course the men stood guard all night long. We thought we had already crossed over into Austria. December 1, a new day. Daylight came early after a short, miserably cold, cold night of getting some sleep. So as this pathetic looking group started to rouse and figure out exactly where we were, uh, someone said they had found some fertilizer bags with German writing on it. And that was a sign of encouragement that perhaps we really were in Austria. Once again, the optimism was scared momentarily when we heard uh, noise of approaching machinery, only to discover that this was the Austrian Red Cross. And they would come out and comb the fields every morning since the refugees had started to cross. And they would come out and comb the fields, pick up stragglers. And we realized that we made it. The Austrian border is about 175 miles with Hungary, a little over 100 miles. And it became the gateway for so many to freedom. Depending on where you crossed over, this could be just walking across a rural field or, or having to cross deep waters, waist deep waters. Um, we were fortunate. We did not run into any obstacles like that. But as the uh, Red Cross picked us up, we uh, were taken to a small village called Andau. At the time, a very insignificant little village, just barely, barely into Austria. But again, this was the first real town, village, that we were taken to. And where exactly? Not really sure, but looking back, it was probably at the school gymnasium. And they had uh, hay sacks on the ground for us to uh, rest and sleep on. But and I'll become somewhat of a landmark. Uh, the author James Michener actually traveled there and spent time interviewing some of these refugees and actually wrote a book about the bridge at Andau. I think the Russians blew it up on November 21st. And it was a rickety piece of construction then. But it's estimated that as many as 70,000 people crossed over during the entire range from when they first began to leave. Once we did get to Andau, again, it was sort of a elation. We were given food, first aid, people with blisters, people with cuts and scrapes, and there were just piles of clothes from people donating. And because some of these people, as I said, had literally left home, hardly even dressed for travel, much less for winter travel. We were traveling with literally what we could carry in the clothes on our backs. This is the first time I ever tasted an orange. We were given chocolate bars. First two words of German that I learned. Bitte, Wasser. Water, please. And I suspect for our parents, it may have been the first real peaceful night in a long time. Years later, I went back to the reconstructed memorial bridge at Andau. Obviously much more elaborate, much more secure than the original. But it's a uh, it's a very important piece for so many people that led them, allowed them to 
to travel. This is again the church uh, taken sometime uh, early 2000s on one of my first visits. Actually 2005, almost 50 years after the fact that I made it home for the first time. I say home. A little bit of it will always be home. So people were arriving at Andal <coughs> with literally, like I said, hand carry baggage and some of their valuable possessions, being greeted by a, a friendly Austrian. And we were given warm food and drinks <coughs> and a place to sleep in freedom. Because these refugees were coming literally every evening, we were being constantly pushed on to make room for the next night's arrivals. And we went from Andal, and we were pushed, transported to Munchhof. And further on, our next stop after that was Linz. And the memories of Linz are, again, dark wooden barracks. They were dry, they were warm. We had wonderfully warm food, a comfortable, peaceful place to sleep. And we didn't care what it looked like. It was safe, safe and it was free, freedom. This is three weeks before Christmas. So my sister Val and I, being the adventurous ones, and another youth, we went in, into town, into Linz, and the store windows were decorated for Christmas. And it was the glamour, the color, the richness, in, in total contrast to the gray, grimness that we had left behind. It was like, it was like we had found a, a, a hole hard to describe. Next we moved on to Salzburg. Again, barracks, cold, stark, but functional. It beats sleeping under the stars under haystacks. These were facilities, again, that were sort of reactivated and pressed into service to handle the incoming arrivals. We had spoken with some people here that some of whom had tried before and were caught, were sent back to wherever they came from, and being determined, they tried again, apparently, with success. And it sort of became a bit comical. At every station that we passed, there were donated clothes, good food, treats, chocolate. But we were still on the move, like a traveling bunch of homeless people. On December the 11th, we are once again on the move, this time to Munich, to military post, not sure which. But all this time, Dad is actively campaigning at the administrative offices, trying to lobby for his family to get them to America. The most memorable thing about the Munich stop was the mess hall. There was this huge, huge mess hall with unlimited supply of milk and these funny little cartons <laughs> we'd never seen. Oranges stacked up in a pyramid. All you had to do was take one. Didn't even have to ask permission. Bananas had never seen one. Didn't know how to eat it. Didn't know how to, what to do with it. 
how to bite into it. <laughs> Orange full of fruit juices and this weird looking little meaty stuff. Later we found out it's called shrimp. <laughs> Not too much of that in Hungary. <laughs> the wonders of decadent Western cuisine. Heaven, we have arrived. It's reported in the aftermath of the failed, re failed re revolt, about 200,000 Hungarians left the country. A significant majority of them going to America, but a number of them uh, wanted to stay in Europe. Some that might have had relatives in neighboring countries, Austria, Germany, thinking that they might even go back to Hungary if and when things improved. Dad never wavered. America was his destination. So on our flight, we depart on the 13th on our way. And somewhere over Scotland, uh, we ran into turbulent weather. And you picture these people My sister tells me years later, or reminds me, the plane is pitching all over the place. There's oranges rolling up and down the aisle. She said it was years before she could make friends with oranges again. <laughs> she was miserably sick. So whether it was the turbulence, whether it was some mechanical issues, the decision was made to land, more than likely at Prestwick. And we're loaded on a bus, once again in the dead of night. Seemed like all refugees traveled in the dead of night. <laughs> but we arrive at this hotel, never heard of it, called the Turnberry. Anybody ever hear of it? <laughs> Been in the news a little bit lately. <laughs> it's a luxury hotel near Ayrshire. And they were hosting this formal ball with people in evening gowns and black tie. And this pathetic looking group of people wander in off these buses, looking like we just crashed <laughs> the most elegant event. These rooms were opulent. We were just overwhelmed and reminded that a month ago, we slept on a pile of coals. A couple of weeks ago, we slept under the stars in haystacks. Later, on a gymnasium floor, and now here we are in the midst of all this luxury. A little ironic. We spent two days there while the weather and whatever mechanical issues might have been remedied. But we enjoyed it. Uh, half the challenge was trying to figure out what to do with all this silverware at the table settings. We had no idea. We had a chance to go down to the, to the shore. And this is December. It was cold and it's windy. I'd never seen the ocean before. These are memories that stay with you forever. On December 15th, we're back in the air. We land in Iceland, refueling stop, and walked across the tarmac. Again, dead of night, mandatory. I see tarmac. Um, an American soldier gave me a military, MPC, military dollar bill that I still have. Once again, we refuel and take off, with Canada being our next fuel stop. Nothing memorable there. By then, everybody was excited just to just to get there, just to get to their destination. And on 16th of December, 
we landed in America. Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. It's about a military camp that was created in 1942 uh, for the U.S. Army. This is where the troops that were being sent to Europe during the war, this was their staging station. And of course, after the war, it had been mothballed. And once again, it was uh, reactivated just in something called Operation Mercy to handle the incoming immigrants, refugees. By the way, the top line, God brought you to America. But we arrive at Camp Kilmer, and these are some of the barracks. Looks kind of uh, wintry and cold and uninviting, but again, it was, finally we had a permanent address. Barracks 702-4. We had a mailing address. We actually had a, a place. By then, uh, we'd accumulated more donated clothing cardboard boxes and a second-hand suitcase. So mom is still caring for the two younger girls. Val and I, with Christmas approaching, we go out and we find a, an evergreen, cut some little twigs and branches. We created our foot-high Christmas tree for the first time in America, in the barracks. Somewhere during our uh, next couple of days, uh, it was announced that one of the local New York newspapers was throwing a Christmas party for some of the youngsters. And they loaded us on a bus, took us in, and uh, had presents, age appropriate for all the kids. And it was just a wonderful experience in this new land. This is two weeks before Christmas. And my dad digs out this 10-year-old address of his friend Charlie and sends him a Christmas card with a short note that we had made it to America. <coughs> he had written his friend some years ago, but as we later, later learned, his, le his friend got the letter but couldn't find anybody to translate any Hungarian. <laughs> and the letter went unanswered sadly. But here we are, 1956, and the Christmas card apparently reached its destination. And soon he received a reply after the first couple of days of January. And his friend Charlie was congratulating him on his good fortune and informing him that arrangements had been made to bring his entire family to Wichita to share his home under his roof. I've been by that house in later years. It's a modest home. He and his wife and a teenage daughter and six more bodies invade this place. I cannot imagine that I would have the generosity to be able to do that for someone that I'd met 10 years ago these were extremely generous and kind people who took us in, and we were grateful. So on January 5th, we board a train. And in our broken English, all we knew, Wichita, Kansas, lower caps, all one word, Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> Wherever that was, we had no idea, but that was our destination. And on January 7th, we arrive in Wichita at Union Station on a cold, snowy morning. And there's Charlie in the tie. And he just marveled, where in the world did you get all this baggage? <laughs> With our beat-up suitcase. 
and cardboard boxes tied with strings. This is kind of where I will stop. Um, this is my family. And that's my mother and my father. And at this point, I'd like to express some thanks. Thank you to America for taking in people who literally arrived with not much more than the clothes on our back and our gratitude. And they asked, asked us nothing of us. And we were thankful. Second, I'd like to thank all the people that I met, that we met along the way, many of whom will never know who they were, that reached out and offered help without asking anything in return. And lastly, I'd like to thank my mom and dad for their incredible courage to be able to walk out with four young kids into the unknown. You don't know where you're going to bed them down that night. You don't know what you're going to feed them that night. But you know that you wanted them to have a better life. And for that, I'll always be thankful. And I thank you all for your attention.